Arya Sharma, who will be speaking of obesity as a chronic disease. In 2002, uh, Arya Sharma, thank goodness, thank goodness this happened, was recruited from the uh, Humboldt University, Berlin, Germany, to uh, a Canada Research Chair Tier 1 in Cardiovascular uh, Obesity and Management at McMaster University. In 2007, he accepted a position as Professor and Chair um, in Obesity Research and Management at the University of Alberta, where he is also the Medical Director of the Edmonton Regional Bariatric Program. Uh, in 2005, he spearheaded the launch of the Canadian Obesity Network. I'm number 591, that's who I am, and now with over 15,000 members, has remarkably transformed the landscape of obesity research and management in Canada. Please join me in welcoming uh, Arya Sharma. Oh, well, thanks, David, for that, and uh, uh, good morning to all of you. So uh, my topic this morning is uh, why obesity is a chronic disease. Uh, here are my disclosures. And I want to jump right into this. As you all know, of course, uh, the CMA came out, uh, I think it's now almost two years ago, and said we have to think of obesity here as a chronic medical disease. Uh, and I know that this was the process of a long deliberation, and Khan had a little bit of influence there. And I, I talked to a lot of the policy people uh, at the uh, CMA as they were making this decision in terms of pros and cons. Uh, but I've also given a lot of top, uh, talks on this topic. Uh, and uh, I think there are some thoughts uh, around this whole concept of obesity as a, as a chronic disease that I want to share with you this morning. Uh, so here's my basic overview. I want to talk about the chronic nature of obesity, which I think is no secret to all of us. Uh, in order to fully appreciate the chronic nature of obesity, one has to understand, you know, the basics of how the body regulates body weight. Uh, and then I want to touch very briefly on uh, sort of the issue of what is thinking of obesity as a chronic disease actually mean for the treatment of patients who have obesity and how we can uh, apply chronic disease models to this uh, uh, patient population. So uh, I've been in a lot of debates and a lot of discussions over the past years ever since this notion has come up that obesity should be thought of as, you know, as a chronic disease like every other chronic disease. Uh, but there's a bunch of arguments that you often hear that are, that are put up against this. And one of the, one of the uh, ones, and probably the uh, amongst all the arguments against calling an obesity a disease, this is probably the one that I think is the most valid, and I'll get back to this point later in my uh, presentation. And this is that we don't actually have a good definition for what obesity actually is. Uh, and this has real consequences. So as we all know, uh, we use body mass index to define the condition, but the problem with that, as again, as we all know, is that it's not really a very good diagnostic test because you would... Uh, if you say it's a chronic disease, then you're really labeling someone as having a disease, uh, and you shouldn't be labeling somebody who has a disease who's actually pretty healthy, uh, which as we know, you know, could be pretty much at any BMI. And uh, that's interesting. Okay, whatever that means. Um, hmm. All right, and we're back. Okay, so the, so the BMI issue is, uh, is a definition problem, and so, so one of the arguments is don't call it a disease till you come up with a better definition. And in fact, actually, the CMA itself in their declaration also pointed this out as, a, out as being a problem, saying, yes, obesity is a chronic disease, but we need to find a better definition for what it is so that we're not mislabeling people. Uh, and I think that's a pretty valid argument, and uh, we can certainly have discussions about how we do this. Uh, Another common argument that you hear is that there's really an inconsistent link between obesity and morbidity and mortality. And that is perfectly true if your definition of obesity is BMI. So if you just look at people's BMIs and try to put that in relationship to their whatever the health problem is, yes, there's an increased risk, but there's lots of people who might meet those BMI criteria who will never get that problem. I mean, even in our clinic, we have uh, uh, you know, the bariatric center in Edmonton, you know, the average patient there has a BMI of 50, and only about 30% of them have diabetes. The other, you know, 70% will probably never get diabetes. Uh, and you can take whatever comorbidity you want, and it's, 
not everybody has every problem. So, uh, so it, it's somewhat of, an, of a valid argument. On the other hand, if you change the definition, say, well, obesity is only when you actually have a health problem, then this argument kind of goes away. Uh, here's another one, and, and this one I don't quite get. Uh, I often hear, well, we shouldn't be calling it a disease because it's modifiable and preventable, uh, and it's, you know, you know, basically a behavior. Uh, so there's a lot of, there's a narrative that is locked into that sentence that I think is something that, uh, you know, we often, very often hear. The first one is, well, it's modifiable and preventable. So what? Uh, most chronic diseases are modifiable and preventable, uh, and we still call them disease. I mean, if you look at heart disease, or I mean, look at any disease, cancer, whatever, uh, they're all somehow modifiable. Uh, they're all somehow preventable. Uh, we still call them diseases. So I don't really see this as being a key argument against it. Uh, what you also see here is the behavioral problem. So again, you know, there are diseases that are largely self-induced by behavior, if you want. So now I. Uh, you know, there's a lot of obesity that has very little to do what, with people's actual behavior. Uh, so this argument, I don't, I don't quite buy. Uh, here's another one that I absolutely don't get, and I hear this a lot from the public health folks. He said, please don't call it a disease because that's going to distract from prevention, uh, which I think is complete nonsense because why, why would it distract from prevention? If, if anything, uh, calling obesity a disease should make it more evident to people that, well, this is a real disease that you're getting or can get, but we definitely need to prevent this. Uh, I mean, calling heart disease, heart disease doesn't stop us from doing heart disease prevention, or calling diabetes di a disease doesn't stop us from trying to prevent diabetes. So I don't really get this argument at all. If anything, you know, I would actually say calling it a disease actually supports the whole issue around public health. Uh, reduces personal responsibility. So again, we've got this narrative, well, you've done this to yourself, it's your own fault kind of thing, and if we now say it's a disease, well, then really we're making an excuse for you not to do anything about it. Uh, I don't get that. Uh, when we look at other chronic diseases, I mean, there's no disease that I know of where the patient does not have some responsibility, even if they're just taking their pill and showing up for visits. Uh, there, there's always some responsibility in trying to manage your own condition, which we call that self-management, uh, and that applies to every other chronic disease. So yeah, the same would apply to obesity, and I don't see how calling this a disease would actually change that at all. Uh, again, if anything, it should actually support that, uh, you know, that idea. Uh, it stigmatizes individuals as disease, and I think that's only true if you use the BMI definition. If, uh, and, and clearly, if you use the BMI definition for obesity and label someone you know, as having obesity, uh, who's perfectly healthy, who doesn't e really have any health problems, well then yes, you are labeling someone as diseased who really doesn't have a disease. Um, and so again, it comes back to this definition issue, which uh, I think is a really important issue and I'll get back to that overall. Again, medicalizes behavior, well the narrative here of course is, well then obesity is a behavior, which obesity isn't. Um, you know, it's a symptom or it's a sign if you want, a, you know, physical sign. Uh, whether there's an underlying behavior that promotes it or doesn't promote it. I mean, there's many, many forms of obesity that have very little to do with behavior. Uh, now, behaviors can reinforce that but, and make the problem worse, uh, but the simplistic idea that, well, obesity is just a behavior and if people change their behaviors, we wouldn't have obesity, and if you can get people to change behaviors, then obesity would just go away. Uh, that's a very common narrative that's out there uh, that simply doesn't hold true based on the biology and based on everything that we've actually know about obesity. So these are the kind of arguments that you would often hear against calling obesity disease. I don't think any of them hold water except the definition issue, uh, which is something that we need to, we, we need to get to and, and think about. Uh, I think in contrast, the arguments for calling obesity disease are actually, to me at least, you know, much stronger. The first one is uh, most people will not argue that obesity ultimately is going to affect uh, health and well-being and quality of life. Uh, and when it does that, then there's, you know, then there's really very little doubt that once you get to the point where your excess weight is affecting your health, well then, it is a disease state and from, that from, from that moment on. Uh, we've also come to realize that there's really no cure for obesity, at least for adult obesity. Uh, once you've got the problem, you're pretty much stuck with the problem for the rest of your life. There are people who can manage. So now you're talking about managing and controlling obesity. Uh, like every other chronic disease, you know, you, uh, I always say there's only two types of people with obesity, treated and untreated. Uh, but I've never met anybody whose obesity has been cured. It, that just does not happen. Uh, and so, you know, you, you kind of 
it, it meets the disease model of, of chronic disease like every other chronic disease. Uh, moving away from, the from looking at obesity purely, it's a consequence of your behavior, you've done this to yourself. I think what we really should be using is a much more complex narrative like we use for all other chronic diseases that, you know, this is a combination of things starting from genetics, epigenetics, psychosocial factors, um, you know, all of the million reasons why somebody could be gaining weight. Uh, and in fact, you know, I would probably argue that these factors or the, the, the range of factors that can lead to obesity ultimately might in fact be wider than for maybe other chronic diseases even. Uh, and I think we need to recognize this and, and, and the notion of calling obesity disease kind of, you know, supports that, that narrative. Uh, we also know that behavioral interventions by and of themselves are generally not all that effective when it comes to treating obesity. Uh, it's not that they're not effective, uh, but, they, but they don't seem to be more effective for obesity than they are for any other chronic disease. So if I put to you, you know, how many of you would think that lifestyle management is important for someone who has diabetes? Everybody, right? We know that. Uh, on the other hand, if I told you, uh, now just imagine for a second, you have got a patient walking into your office, A1C is 12, uh, and all you have is lifestyle. You've got no medication, you've got no metformin, you've got nothing, right? You've got the diabetes educator and you can teach them about, you know, their disease, self-education, self-monitoring, all of the things. And imagine you've got 100 patients like that. How many of those patients do you think, you know, two years later are going to have a significant reduction in their A1Cs? Handful, maybe nobody. Or imagine you've got people with hypertension walking into your clinic and, and all you have is, you know, well, we recommend the DASH diet and, you know, increase your fruits and vegetables and start exercising and maybe some stress management classes and, you know, measure your blood pressure every day. Uh, and that's the only treatment you have to offer. There's, there's no pharmacotherapy uh, for hypertension. How effective would you be in controlling hypertension in your clinic? Very few patients would succeed. Uh, obesity is pretty much the same story. Uh, without the use of pharmacotherapy, without the use of bariatric surgery, and I would, fuss, I would almost say, you know, without the use of treatments that actually work, Behavioral interventions alone, if that's all you have to offer to patients, well, don't expect magic. Your success rates are going to be very similar as trying to manage patients with diabetes and have no medications or patients who have high cholesterol and you have no statins and you have no, no drugs. Uh, that's what happens to all of these, if you want to call them lifestyle disease, it's the same story. So it's not that lifestyle interventions, behavior modification is not important. It is important and it does support treatment. Obviously, if you have a patient who's also following, you know, all of the behaviors that you're recommending, is going to do a much better job of managing their diabetes or is going to do a much better job of managing their hypertension. But alone, lifestyle interventions are as ineffective, if you want, for obesity as they are for every other chronic disease. Uh, and I think we have to recognize that and we have to acknowledge that, that our tools are very limited there. Uh, access to care, I think, is one of the biggest argument. Uh, we have a responsibility for care. So once you say it's a disease, well, now the healthcare system then now needs to step up to the plate and say, okay, if this is a disease, then what are we doing for patients? And you've just seen the report card. Uh, in Canada right now, we're not actually doing much. Uh, that needs to change, and I think that the way you change that is to say, well, this is a chronic disease, and patients who have this chronic disease deserve treatment like every other patient who has any other chronic disease, and those treatments need to be made available uh, and accessible for patients with this chronic disease in the healthcare system. All right. Uh, finally, uh, there is actually evidence, and it was presented here, that, that once you change the narrative around obesity, and you say, you know, we, we really do need to think of obesity as a chronic disease, uh, that actually destigmatizes the problem. So in the contrast, uh, so, so in contrast to what a lot of people think that if you start calling this a disease, you're stigmatizing people, you're making them feel bad about themselves, you're saying this is hopeless, uh, you're now calling people, you know, living with a chronic disease. Uh, actually, the, what the research shows, and I know that, you know, there's, there's not tons of research, but the research that we do have on this issue of how do you change the narrative actually supports this idea that once you come out and say it's a disease, uh, that's almost a relief for a lot of patients who actually have the problem. And you can talk to the PC members at this meeting, and I'm sure that that's what most of them will tell you. 
that when you change the narrative from saying, oh, this is just a lifestyle problem or it's a risk factor to saying, no, this is actually a, this is actually a chronic lifelong disease that you're going to have to live with, uh, that really takes a lot of burden and guilt and shame and all of those things uh, you know, tend, to, tend to actually drop uh, in the understanding of what obesity is. Uh, finally, I think of obviously saying it's a medical disease, uh, it's a chronic disease, uh, now has implications for education. Uh, we need to be training all health professionals, whether it's, you know, whether it's doctors or whether it's uh, nurses or it's dietitians, everybody needs to learn about obesity as a chronic disease. Uh, and uh, I think this recognition that obesity is a chronic disease is certainly going to have an influence on uh, curricula. Um, I would like to see a future where any graduating medical student knows as much about obesity management and has learned and has spent actual time in obesity clinics and managing patients with obesity, uh, you know, as you would expect any, any medical graduate to be comfortable uh, managing someone with diabetes or managing someone with high blood pressure or COPD or whatever, whatever the other conditions are. Uh, we know that currently that's not happening. Uh, in our clinic where we pretty much, I mean, I have somebody shattering us in the clinic almost every day and they're all residents and these are people very often who are in their fifth year, fourth year of residency. Uh, and this is the first time they've ever actually been in an obesity clinic. This is the first time they've actually done an assessment for obesity. This is the first time they've actually uh, maybe s even seen a patient who's had bariatric surgery. And, and these guys are, you know, ready to go off into the real world. Uh, that needs to stop. That needs to change. And hopefully this, uh, this idea around obesity being a chronic disease is going to change that. Uh, and finally, uh, I think that also talking about obesity as a chronic disease has the potential to increase research funding for this disease. Uh, if there is one unmet need in terms of treatment, uh, it certainly is obesity. If, if a patient walks through the door with diabetes, I've got, what, 40 different drugs and insulins that I can put them on. If a patient walks in with hypertension, I've got 100 different compounds I can put them on. Uh, th there are no unmet needs in diabetes management when it comes to m new molecules. There's no real unmet need when it comes to hypertension management. Uh, if there is one glaring unmet need, it certainly is obesity. We, we, we simply don't have the tools. Uh, bariatric surgery, as good a treatment as it is, is simply not scalable to the size of the problem. Uh, you know, we do 10,000 operations a year. We got 1.5 million people who need it. So while well, this is going to take us 150 years to do. So it's not, it's not a scalable solution. This is not speaking against bariatric surgery. This is just that bariatric surgery is not a treatment that can be scaled to the size of the problem. When you're thinking of what treatments can you actually use in real life for treating millions of people who have this condition, well, then we need to look at other conditions that affect millions of people and think about how are we treating those conditions. Uh, how many Canadians wake up every morning and take their blood pressure pills? How many Canadians wake up every morning and take their metformin? How many Canadians wake up every morning and take their statins? No, actually, they should be taking those in the evening, but whatever, <laughs> right? Uh, Medications are scalable. You can't, at least theoretically, if you, had the com if you had the medication and it's safe and it's efficacious and it works, uh, at least theoretically, you could scale that treatment uh, to millions of people. You can't do that with bariatric surgery. And uh, unfortunately, uh, if you've been, especially if you've been listening to Michael Ballas here at this uh, um, conference, who will tell you just how much, how expensive and how, how difficult it is to have lasting behavior change. It, that's not a cheap treatment. That's not an... Uh, that, uh, that's also not a treatment that is scalable. Uh, we simply would not have enough resources in the healthcare system to uh, not just induce, but to induce and sustain behavior change in millions of Canadians. Uh, even if it was effective enough, we couldn't do it. So that ultimately you know, leaves us with very few options until and unless we, uh, we have medications that work for obesity that can be used large scale for millions of Canadians, we're not going to have solutions. So I think this whole idea of obesity being a chronic disease, uh, when I look at the arguments in favor of calling obesity disease, I, I strongly stand on the side of uh, calling it a disease, and I think uh, what we are going to be seeing is a change in attitude, uh, hopefully not just, ju not just amongst providers and health professionals, but also hopefully amongst patients who will now stand up for themselves and say, listen, I've got this chronic disease, uh, and I demand care from the healthcare system the same way that everybody else who has any other chronic disease, um, you know, demands care from the healthcare system. Uh, so those are just the thoughts uh, I wanted to share with you this morning, and uh, I'd, and we'll take questions later, I guess. Thank you.
Thank you, Dr. Sharma. Uh, the next presentation will be uh, given by Denise campbell Sharer. She's an associate professor in the Department of Family Medicine at the University of Alberta. Uh, she's a practicing family physician, researcher, and teacher. She's co-lead with Dr. Sharma for the implementation and validation of a five A's framework of obesity in primary care, the five A team uh, project. So the goal of the study is to increase the quality and quantity of obesity management in primary care by using the 5A T's intervention to change uh, provider behavior. Dr. Campbell Scherer's research focuses on innovations and transformation uh, to clinical practice and results in change in benefits to patients, providers, and the healthcare system. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Campbell Scherer. Sorry, yes, yeah. Let's click on this one. Uh, this one here. Okay. Great. Well, thank you so much, everybody, for coming. And I'm thrilled to be here to share a little bit about what we've been doing um, in this program of work. Uh, just out of curiosity, how many people here see patients on a regular basis? So most of us, fantastic. How many people see patients in primary care? So a great number, fantastic, good. I always like to check that out ahead of time so that I don't have to talk too much about context. Um, just in terms of disclosures, this work has been funded by Alberta Innovates Health Solutions and I have to acknowledge the tremendous in-kind support from our clinical partner, the Edmonton Southside Primary Care Network, uh, without whom none of this would happen. Um, and so those are just my disclosures. Um, in this particular work, it's, as I just said, uh, funded through research, uh, so there was no commercial um, involvement. So uh, I always say wicked problems take wicked teams, and that's why I like to acknowledge the team up front. So these are all the people who have either for a short time or for a long time been walking on this journey with us. Um, and I just want to highlight something. I think um, one of the things I've learned from working with all these people is that I uh, you have to have an interdisciplinary approach. And so we have anthropologists, and we have public health, and we have nursing, and nutrition, and psychiatry, and family medicine, and obesity medicine, and all sorts of different folks, community members, clinical champions. Um, and everybody has brought uh, a really important piece to the puzzle. So thank you to everybody on the team. So I like to show this picture. Um, when I, uh, when I first came out in practice and worked as a family doc, for the first 12 years, I had a really big practice. I had 2,200 patients. I was doing inpatient, outpatient, was doing eMERGE for a time. I had no training at all on obesity prevention and management, none. And for the first decade, I, I worked in a place where I didn't actually have much in the way of interdisciplinary team access. And so this was how I felt about obesity. It was this massive thing in my practice, in my day-to-day -day life, and I was completely at sea with it. I had no idea how to help my patients, and I would try, but I, looking back at it now, I know that I was singularly ineffective, right? And when we think about that, um, you know, when we think about the prevalence of this problem globally, and we think about the problem in Canada, and we see this 450% increase in severe obesity in Canada affecting 1.5 million people, as Aria was just saying, this is not something that we can just refer away, right? We can't just refer this. We actually have to learn, and we have to learn how to help patients and how to move this forward in primary care. And there's an expectation that we're gonna do so you know, we see these kinds of headlines in the newspaper. Um, and we know that there's this push to try to um, get a grip on this problem. We have guidelines, and the Canadian Obesity Network, together with PHAC and CIHR, developed the five A's of obesity management, which is a wonderful suite of tools and resources for use in primary care to take all that emerging knowledge that all of you have created in the obesity world and try to, try to get it into primary care. But what we know is that changing practice it's not enough to write a guideline or to, to make a toolkit. We actually have to think about the how are we gonna do that? How do we make it work in the real messy world that we live in clinically? 
And we know that this isn't just a problem in Alberta. We know this is a problem internationally. So this was the quote out of The Lancet from Dr. Deitz on this topic. And um, so that's why I'm pretty passionate. The one thing I'd like to see when I retire, I would like it to be that when a person living with obesity goes to see their family doc or their primary care team, that they have a very different experience of care than what I gave them for the first decade of my practice. That's the goal. So what we wanted to do with this project was we wanted to develop, implement, and evaluate a pragmatic and sustainable intervention based on the content of the five A's um, to change provider behavior and team behavior to increase the quality and quantity of weight management happening in primary care. And this was something that was a participatory approach we had with our partners, Edmonton Southside Primary Care Network. So for those of you not familiar in Alberta, about 85% of patients are part of a PCN. And our PCN at the time we started served about 200,000 patients. Um, and it's a, it's a way of embedding interdisciplinary team into primary care. So to move from the 1970 Marcus Welby, you know, style of mom and pop shop family practice into true patient med center medical home interdisciplinary team care. So this is the mechanism. And what we found in our PCN was that even though we were training all of our team members on obesity level one and two Alberta Health Services training for obesity, when we looked at what was actually happening in, in clinic, they weren't doing it, right? So these are folks who are taking care of large numbers of folks with type two diabetes and other chronic diseases, and, and yet they weren't actioning the, uh, the weight stuff. So they were really interested and motivated in changing that, as were we. So we partnered in the creation of this grant and wrote it together. Uh, and it was a randomized control trial in 24 clinics that had to have a team embedded for at least a year prior to the start of the trial. Um, and uh, I'm not going to spend a lot of time on methods, but if anybody's interested in that, it was an RCT. It did have a convergent mixed method evaluation so that we would know what the impacts were beyond the quantitative outcome measures. What were the issues with context? Hmm, whoops. Oh, it did it again. What were the, uh, what were the issues with context which may have um, affected it? And what were the issues with process? And I don't know what button to push to make this come back. Thank you. Um, so the issue was we did publish that in um, implementation. I want to stay on time. I practice. I'm 19 minutes and 36 seconds. <laughs> so, so I want to make sure I stay on time. So anyway, if you're interested in the methods, we did publish that in Implementation Science in 2014. And there was a sub-patient study as well that I'll touch on, but most of this work was on teams and providers and how we change practice. So we did not come in as ivory tower academics to talk to these folks and tell them how to do their job and come up with some sort of intervention and impose it. Rather, we created it with them. So what we did was we got together with all the intervention practitioners and we said, hey, what do you guys want to know to do your job differently and better that you don't know? And they came up with 42 topics. And so we had a heart attack. Uh, but fortunately, because of the connections we have in the Alberta scene with Aria and others, we were able to actually do it. So the, so the intervention was a six-month intervention. They were released from clinical duties two hours every two weeks for six months. The first hour was a session built around their self-identified needs of what they wanted content-wise. And the second hour was a learning collaborative about sitting together as teams, talking about where the rubber hits the road, sharing best practices, um, doing goal setting around practices, and trying to figure out how to actually operationalize it in practice. So if you're interested in the theoretical underpinnings of the intervention and the details, we published that in BMC Research Notes, um, 2015, I guess. So um, we wanted this to be a living thing because we know that this is a unique opportunity we had and we know the challenges that different clinics will have. If you have a small clinic somewhere that wants to do this work, they're not gonna have the opportunity of doing this kind of process. So we actually created on the CON website, the 5 Ace team page, and on the side, all those little blue bars, those are all modules where you can actually see the presentations, see the discussion guides, uh, there's learning tips, um, and there's links. So we don't, I'm allergic to reinventing the work that other people have done. So if we could find resources other people had created on these topics, we linked to them, we tried to highlight them. And then when the providers said, hey, 
I need a tool for this. I'm struggling with how to do this in my clinic. If we couldn't find a tool, then we would create the tool. So we tried to find other great tools first. So the tools that we created are all free downloads as well um, on, the, on the page. And that was an iterative process. So that tool co-creation and development was published as well, I think, in 2016, 15, I think. So what did we find? Well, what we found from the providers, um, so they were all anonymously interviewed and we had field notes and things for the sources of data. We found from the providers that they found this an incredibly complex and sensitive topic. So that would be part of the reason why they had challenge bringing it up. They also found that there was tons of differential messaging. So if the doc is giving the wrong message to the patient, right, and then the patient goes to see the dietitian colleague with a totally wrong set of expectations, that sets us all up for failure, right? The second thing was this concept of it being embedded in other conditions. So I can tell you, I spent a decade doing diabetes visits. I would talk about blood pressure, statins, eye exams, I would do foot exams. I did that for a decade without ever talking about obesity, right? And so were our practitioners in the PCN, right? So I don't see people for weight. It always comes in the form of diabetes, you know. Or this practitioner is saying, well, I know if I work on the portion control, that's going to help their blood sugars, right? And that's going to help their weight. So I don't need to bring that up, right? This was a representative quote. What we found as they started working with the material, that the key thing that let them start to do the work was this relationship. So this concept, if they had a good relationship, they could kind of broach into this waters. We found, I'll talk a little bit more about teams. Teams were crucial to doing this work effectively. And then this concept of individual ability. So helping people learn new ways of integrating this material and working with it in their practice was really, really important. Work environment was really important. So if you had a clinic where one of the practitioners said, I feel so uncomfortable in my clinic that I'm eating my lunch in my car, that's not a work environment where you're going to have people new co-create new ways of working together to solve this problem, right? So work environment was crucial. In general, most of the work environments were pretty good. And then innovations, values, fit. So was there good fit for the professionals between their previous knowledge, experience, clinical experience, and what they were learning in the, in the intervention? And the intervention, there was really strong innovation, values, fit, which we were really happy to see. Something that came out that was really crucial, um, which was a driver in people being able to do this work, was this concept of interdisciplinary confidence. So this was a major theme that emerged in the data. And that was, did everybody on the team have the same messaging and approach? And using this approach of the five A's helped to standardize some of that messaging um, and understanding of the condition. Were people available for consultations within the group around clinical cases? Role perception, did everybody actually know what everybody did? And it was funny because we were working with the mental health workers and one of them, four months into the intervention, three months into the intervention, in the middle of one of the sessions said, I just had an aha moment. I now understand why I'm here, right? So, so people in their professional identity understanding that helping people li live with um, their depression, their anxiety, their OCD, their ADHD, all of those things, helping people to live with that better, is actually crucial to them being able to make strides in terms of um, managing their obesity. Um, and then uh, this appropriate referrals. So it can't just be the doc saying, well, you know, your A1C is a little out of kilter, uh, your weight's up a bit, you need to go see the dietitian. No, 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 no. <laughs> so getting people to actually ask permission, figure out a little bit what's going on about the root cause, and figuring out, is the dietitian the right first point of call? Maybe the dietitian is not the right first point of call, maybe, right? And the other thing that the practitioners did in one of the tools was talk to each other about what are the core messages, right? So if the dietitian is picking up that there's depression, making sure that the patient gets connected into the mental health. And they had to practice those scripts and share a little bit together about how to work across disciplinary lines. So when they had good relationships and support and communication, those things could be negotiated. Um, and and that would result in good collaboration and role distribution. So these are examples of quotes. So the person on the left, really good communication in clinic, feels really connected. Person on the right, not so much, right? And these types of things were crucial, and you'll see that in the results, uh, in terms of driving whether or not the outcomes happened. So what we're going for is interdisciplinary teams like with providers like this, where people feel like they're respected for what they're doing, they're able to work to the full scope. Um, and one of the things that emerged was this, this concept of 
working with everybody all together to co-create this new clinical reality um, was really important and it helped everybody um, share and change how they were doing work. So as mentioned, this embeddedness was a huge issue. You can, primary care is fantastic because you see people from preconception to death, right? And I have patients in my families where I have the grandparents, the aunts and uncles, the parents and the kids, and they're all my patients. So you see people over time, over years, and you have an opportunity to intervene if you feel that you have the, stool, the capability to do so. So the, the steps in the middle are the things that were necessary to shift us to being able to do that work. Um, so what did we find in the trial? So in the trial, in terms of the um, qualitative data of impacts, um, at the provider level, what we saw was lots of examples of people um, really recognizing that obesity is a chronic dis condition, chronic, chronic disease, not a choice. Better patient-first language, increased self-awareness of their practice, better self-evaluation of their practice, internalization of those five A's core concepts. And that led them to shift their clinical mind line or their mental map of how they were taking care of obesity in their own clinical consultations. And they perceived that this was really making a difference in terms of their patient engagement, um, in terms of changing goals from weights to you know, functional goals. Um, they perceived a much more patient-centered approach. They were all much more confident, not all, there was one that was not, but most of them were much more confident in asking permission to discuss weight. And one of the things that they relayed was, one of the nurses uh, was saying one day, yeah, so I tried the ask with a patient and they said no. So they went on and talked about other things. And the patient came back three months later and said, I'm ready to talk about it now, right? And so they really found that this opened up a whole new space for them in their clinical consultations, which they found to be very um, empowering and, and gave them a whole new narrative that, you know what, you haven't failed just because the weight hasn't changed. There's so many other things we can be working on in the space. Um, it really led to changes in provider-provider impacts. Now, this was driven a lot by the functionality of the clinics and the relationships, but they really became change agents in their clinics. Um, they really, uh, there's lots of examples of increased interdisciplinary work. So in one of the French clinics, they actually created a new little, on their own, a new little um, uh, group sessions for pregnant women where the mental health worker and the nurse and the dietitian would get together and provide support for patients. This was initiated by the providers, not by the clinic. So new ways of working together to do the work. And this led to a lot of observation of changes at the clinic level. Like all these clinics now have bariatric furniture. This was not something the research team drove. This was something that the patient, that the participants championed. So just a much more uh, friendly environment and changes in processes and visits to do the work better. These providers also advocated for changes at the primary care network level where um, they address gaps in existing programming uh, and have shifted the work to foster team development. I don't know what we were thinking in the PCN. I, I don't know why we thought that if we just put everyone together, I guess we thought maybe we would sprinkle magic fairy dust and teams would appear. And, and what became apparent in this work is that that doesn't work. So actually, in the PCN, when we have new, new clinics joining, and we're now up to 300,000 patients in 280, 285 physician practices, um, when new ones join now, we actually sit down to them with them and talk to them about it, what it means to have a team. <laughs> and we actually have a bunch of initiatives going around effective team building, because uh, we've recognized that fairy dust doesn't exist. So um, I'm excited because today, actually, this paper came out in CMAJ Open, and this is a little bit more on the results um, that I just was sharing with you if you're interested in any details. The quantitative results continue to be a struggle to get published because, of course, we didn't look at anything important like patient weight. Pause. Okay. Um, <laughs> but we're working on getting it published. So the, the results were over the six-month intervention, we had a 30% increase in the providers doing weight management um, in their encounters. So these are on their encounter forms. They may have been dealing with a prenatal visit, but it has to have been, they perceived it as being a, a major part of the consultation, was up 30% over the six months of intervention. And we actually formally followed it for 15 months post-intervention, or sorry, nine months post-intervention, and it stayed up at 38% increase. Now you notice these broad confidence intervals spanning the line of no effect. Well, because it was a convergent mixed method evaluation, we actually, before we unblinded the results, we predicted who would and who wouldn't change based on all those emergent themes. And we were pretty much right. So the people, the one practitioner who shared with the anthropologist in private that they dreaded these visits, 
actually never did a visit, ever. Um, but so there was a couple of people who were avoidant, lacking in confidence, or there were these, these dysfunctional teams and people were eating lunch in the car. Those people didn't change. That's what's driving the arm of the, of the outcome that was on the no change end. A lot of the people though, lots of improved confidence, strong interdisciplinarity, strong teams, see a need to, to change, strong CDM focus, those people changed a lot. So um, we, we consider this positive. <laughs> so. Uh, the patient sub-study. So um, what we've done is actually we have a cohort of people living with obesity in this context that we've been looking at how they've been doing over time. And we've been doing qualitative research on, on this group. Um, and we wanted to know from them, people who are receiving care in this context, what do they think about the care they're getting? Is it meeting their needs? What do they want from us? What do they want from their primary care um, providers? And one of the things that came out a lot was uh, around physicians. The patients in our context have an expectation that their family doctor will initiate the conversation. And they expect us to be careful and kind and knowledgeable, right? Shouldn't be a stretch for a bunch of family docs. Um, uh, I think the issue, when I reflect on this data, when I reflect on the data, what I think it speaks to, I see it as being very similar to depression 20 or 30 years ago. So people were scared to talk about suicide because someone might go kill themselves. Um, they didn't know how to do it. Now people know how to assess for suicidality. They know how to assess for lethality. They know how to assess for homicidality. They know how to diagnose and how to triage and how to manage a lot better in terms of mental health. And I think that's really where we are in primary care. I mean, family docs in Canada right now are having to do physician-assisted death, um, you know, palliative care, uh, you know, obstetrical care. I had a patient the other day in my clinic we, who couldn't go home because we had to call the police because it was not safe for her to go home. So we do lots of stuff in clinic that takes time. So it's not time. It's do you feel confident in being able to do the work and be helpful? And I think we have a real mission here for training, right? Patient, pe the people in our study really wanted a coordinated whole person approach around all their drivers and they want it personalized. So they really like the courses we're offering in the primary care network. Um, if you think about it, we have 100 in FTE of team and we have 300,000 patients, right? 100,000 patients who we serve live with obesity. Right? So we have to think about how to scale these things so at that point when they're meeting with their doc, they have effective care. Um, am I doing okay on time? I have 14 minutes and 43 seconds. Uh, how, am I, how am I doing? Oh, maybe it stopped. Oh, gosh. Oh, 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 so, okay. I will go quick. Sorry, the timer stopped when the thing ends. I knew I was going to get off. I thought it sounded like I had, okay, I'll be, I'll be oh, dear. Sorry, okay, I'll be really, really fast. This is just an illustration from the patients. This is not a good time to intervene on this patient, right? This is why the story matters. Where is somebody and intervening where they're at? I will wind this up. Okay, more patient stuff. We published that. Our bigger thing, moving on. Okay, so the vision, so the vision, anyway, the vision of this is that we just need to start to do more work in this space, right? And my hope is that with the new grads coming out, this will be their view, right? They won't have this big obstruction in the landscape, and they'll know how to help people living with obesity. Sorry. Thank you. No, no, no. I didn't realize that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Thank you, Dr. Campbell Scherer. I'm going to introduce now Dr. Sue Peterson. Dr. Sue is a specialist in endocrinology and metabolism, having completed her training at the University of Calgary. She's an ABOM diplomat. Over the last decade, uh, she has worked at the University of Saskatchewan, University of Copenhagen, Denmark, where she began her work in obesity research. She has a busy endocrinology practice at the C. Endo Diabetes and Endocrinology Clinic in Calgary, with a focus on type 2 diabetes and obesity. She's a member of the expert committee for the 2018 Canadian Diabetes Guidelines, and she is a principal investigator for several research studies in diabetes and obesity. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Sue Peterson. Good morning, everybody. Good morning. 
good, good. Everyone's awake. I'm glad to hear that. Great. Uh, wonderful. Well, thank you uh, so much for having me here today. And uh, thanks. I'll, I'll try to live up to the uh, awesome talks from Aria and Denise. Um, my uh, topic, I, I was asked to speak about uh, treating diabetes and obesity. So this is something I feel very strongly about um, merging these goals. And I'm really, really pleased to be here to try to go through everything there is to say about this in 20 minutes. Am I still okay to do 20 minutes? That'll be okay, great, perfect. That wasn't a crack at you, it's okay, it was really good. <laughs> um, so these are my disclosures. So uh, as you heard, I'm involved in studies of uh, pharmacotherapy in type two diabetes, type one diabetes, obesity, involved in bariatric surgery research as well, and uh, I'm involved in a lot of continuing medical education. And as always, my presentations and recommendations are based on the evidence. So the objectives that I've outlined for today are, number one, to discuss the approach to align the goals of optimizing glycemic control and weight maintenance in patients who have diabetes. Secondly, to discuss the benefits of weight management in people with diabetes. Why is this important? And thirdly, to review the treatment options for weight management in the context of diabetes. So we'll go through lifestyle management, pharmacotherapy, and bariatric surgery in 20 minutes. <laughs> um, okay, so I always like to speak in the context of a clinical case because at the end of the day, this is what we're looking for, right? We're, there's a lot of clinicians in the audience. Uh, we want to know how am I going to go home next week and improve the management of my patients who have diabetes and obesity or overweight. So meet Ernie. Ernie is a gentleman who's had type 2 diabetes for about five years. He's got sleep apnea, hypertension. He's on metformin and he's on a sulfonylurea, glycoside, 60 milligrams once a day. Um, he's on ACE inhibitor, statin therapy. His blood pressure is running a little bit higher than we'd like it to be. Uh, he struggles with his weight, his BMI is 41. His A1C, which we'd like to see at least down to 7%, is running about 8.1, and it was about the same over the last six months. So he's been working on lifestyle modification, hasn't seen much improvement in his sugars. His sugars in the morning are running a little bit above our target of seven, and the two-hour post-meal are running above the target of 10. Lifestyle hasn't been working well for Ernie, and he needs help. He's tried to decrease his portion size, but when he did that, he ran into troubles with low blood sugar. And what happens when you have a low blood sugar? What do you need to do? Eat, Eat right. And uh, he's also been trying to incorporate activity into his life. So he uh, started trying to do some exercise, do some walking, but he feels that he needs to eat in order to avoid low blood sugars when he does that. So you can see we have some divergent goals here. We've got some limitations with regards to his therapy for his diabetes that are actually impeding his ability to uh, manage his weight well. Um, in the interest of time, uh, you know, the, the, it's really important to point out that there's much more to any individual's weight struggle than just medications and sugars uh, when they have diabetes. We still need to be looking at the big picture, you know, what are the hedonic mechanisms, is his sleep apnea well treated, all of those things, but um, in the interest of time, I'm just really going to narrow in and focus on diabetes-related issues. So what are our goals here? Clearly, we want to work to optimize weight and diabetes control simultaneously. Let's align those goals. Right now, they're divergent in Ernie's situation. Take home message for you guys, always think about treating diabetes to fit a patient's lifestyle rather than them having to change their lifestyle to fit their diabetes treatment. We're in an era where we've got lots of choices of medications. It doesn't have to be the way it was 20 years ago when we were much more limited in our choices and patients had to change their lifestyle to fit their diabetes treatments. And of course, we want to improve overall health, not just diabetes control with optimal weight management. So, first thing we want to do is consider the effect of medications to treat diabetes on body weight. So we have three classes of medications that cause weight gain. That's sulfonylureas, methiazolidinediones, and insulin. Uh, also the meglidinides, which is gluconorm, cousin to the sulfonylurea, so technically four classes. There are uh, medications that are weight neutral, so that's the metformin and the DPP-4 inhibitors. And we have two classes of medications now that can facilitate weight loss, and that is the GLP-1 receptor agonists and the SGLT-2 inhibitors. 
Now let's think about hypoglycemia, because as we saw in Ernie's case, this is a major challenge for him to be able to manage his weight well. He's on a medication that causes hypoglycemia, which is a sulfonylurea. So the sulfonylureas, the cousin meglidinides, and insulin are the medications that can cause hypoglycemia. Now there's a lot of people who have type 2 diabetes who do need to be on insulin, and insulin is a very powerful tool. Uh, we can get very good glycemic control with insulin. A lot of people need it when they're in the later stages of the natural history of diabetes, but we can incorporate insulin treatment with other treatments like GLP-1 receptor agonists, SGLT2 inhibitors, so that we can mitigate the weight gain or help someone who's on insulin with type 2 diabetes accomplish some weight loss with the addition of those medications. Many other classes of medications outside of just glycemia, right, antidepressant medications and many other classes that a patient with diabetes may also be on that we have to take into consideration. So remember that weight loss, we generally try to aim for 5 to 10 percent weight loss, but even 2 to 3 percent weight loss can cause uh, multiple metabolic benefits in a patient with type 2 diabetes even a little bit of improvement in blood sugar, cholesterol, and blood pressure as well. So anything we can do to manage this patient's weight, even if it's just a difference of a couple of percent, will mean something in the context of their overall health. So what are the guidelines for obesity management, say, in Canada? Well, I, I know this audience knows them very well, uh, but to contextualize it in the realm of diabetes, we would be considering uh, behavioral modification. Of course, that's a cornerstone of treatment of diabetes always. Um, if they have a BMI greater than or equal to 25, then that is appropriate. And some people who perhaps carry excess weight but have a BMI that falls in the normal range, because remember, BMI doesn't tell you anything about composition, body composition. Um, this is important. Pharmacotherapy uh, for weight management can be considered in a patient with a BMI of 27 or greater. Um, with diabetes, and bariatric surgery uh, can be considered in a patient with type 2 diabetes with a BMI of 35 or greater. So lifestyle management, just a couple of high-level points. Of course, remember the five A's. Denise, thank you so much for speaking uh, so eloquently about that. Lifestyle, of course, is the cornerstone of management of diabetes as well as um, obesity. And the ideal goal, yes, 5 to 10 percent, but we always want to contextualize that to the individual, right? If a patient has been having a weight gain trajectory, if we can accomplish weight neutrality without further weight gain, then that's a success for our patient. So, of course, it's very individualized, as you guys know well. What does the evidence tell us about lifestyle intervention in people with type 2 diabetes? The Look Ahead trial, of course, is a landmark trial that looked at the effect of lifestyle intervention on cardiovascular events, weight loss, fitness, and metabolic parameters. Um, it was actually stopped because they were not seeing a reduction in cardiovascular events or death, but I think it's really important to remember that there were a lot of health benefits that were seen in the, in the Look Ahead trial. Weight improved, glycemia improved, blood pressure, lipids, and let's not forget those very important things that are uh, difficult to quantitative, quantitatively assess, quality of life, physical functioning, mobility, well-being, all very important. So at um, eight years, they saw, so if you, on the, the left panel, this is the change in body weight over eight years in the look-ahead study. So people who were in an intensive lifestyle intervention compared to standard care uh, lost uh, quite a bit of weight at the beginning, and then their weight started to come back up again. But even at eight years, there was a difference of 2.6% body weight. Uh, A1C, likewise, also saw a nice dip down in the beginning, and this is now up to four years where they collected A1C data. The A1C started to drift back up, but was still um, statistically better at four years. Now, why this drop in weight and rebound upwards and drop in A1C and rebound upwards? Well, we know that intentional weight loss with any type of lifestyle intervention is difficult to sustain over the long term. And this is true of people with or without uh, type 2 diabetes. So we see that over time, weight tends to come back up. And this is what was seen in the Look Ahead trial as well. So the Look Ahead teaches us that yes, lifestyle is very important and can have some benefits, though realistically speaking, it's difficult to manage just with lifestyle over the long term. So this is where we now talk about pharmacotherapy for weight management in the context of type 2 diabetes. 
There are two medications approved for obesity management in Canada. That's Orlistat and Loreglutide. So I'll take you through the evidence in diabetes for those. Orlistat in type 2 diabetes is uh, successful to uh, improve weight loss um, with 6.2% weight loss compared to 4.3% in controls. So it's not a huge difference, but there is some statistically significant benefit. Uh, people with uh, diabetes tend to have less weight loss success than people who don't have diabetes with uh, any intervention, probably related to their insulin resistant nature. That reason is not completely clear, but uh, these numbers are uh, thus a little bit lower than they are in people without diabetes. Um, in this study, also important to point out that these patients were on sulfonylurea treatment. And we just talked about how sulfonylureas cause weight gain. They also can cause low blood sugars. So this, this population was already impeded somewhat in their ability to lose weight because of their diabetes drugs. Um, that being said, they were able to see a delta of about 0.46% A1C improvement in the people on Orlistat versus placebo. And they also saw that they were able to decrease their sulfonylurea use uh, by virtue of weight loss and improvement in um, metabolic parameters as well. Liraglutide um, is the other medication in Canada for approved for weight management um, in people with or without type 2 diabetes. And this is the uh, data specifically for people who have type 2 diabetes. Um, the Weight reduction is dose dependent. So in the dark blue line at the bottom, this is liraglutide three milligrams, which the uh, trade name for that, of course, is Saxenda. Uh, 1.8 milligrams, that's the Victoza uh, commercial dose, um, saw 4.8% weight loss versus 2.2% in placebo. So uh, a dose dependent weight loss is seen with liraglutide in people with type two diabetes. The A1C, uh, we seem to see most of the benefit from an A1C reducing perspective at the 1.8 milligram dose. So between, uh, one point, uh, between the 1.8 milligram dose, there was 1.1% A1C reduction versus 1.3% A1C reduction on the three milligram dose. And that's why the 1.8 milligram dose is what is approved as Victoza for type two diabetes treatment, because that's where we see most of the A1C benefit. But then you can go up, go up to 2.4, then three milligrams as Saxenda, for weight management for an additional weight loss benefit. And the third treatment category then of course is bariatric surgery. Um, so there are four main types of bariatric surgery. Um, the gold standard is considered to be the Rouen-Y gastric bypass, which is, in, uh, is C in the lower left, where a smaller stomach is created and then about 150 centimeters of small intestine are bypassed such that fresh nutrients are seen for the first time digested further down in the small intestine. The top right is the sleeve gastrectomy, where most of the stomach is removed and turned into the shape of a sleeve, hence the name, also promoting a faster transit of nutrients into the small intestine. Um, the bottom right is um, the biliopancreatic diversion, which also is often done with a duodenal switch. So it, uh, it is kind of a combination of turning the stomach into a sleeve and a more extensive uh, version of the Rouen-Y gastric bypass. So it's more of a malabsorptive surgery because a lot more of the intestine is bypassed. And then at the top left, we have the gastric band, uh, which is an inflatable band used to create a small pouch, uh, which limits food consumption. Um, the gastric band is different from the other three procedures in that all of the other three procedures create uh, faster transit of nutrients uh, into the small intestine. And in the case of the lower two, also um, the nutrients are seen further down the intestine for the first time. And so when you have that, that, that happening, you have not only the restrictive mechanism of the smaller stomach, but also a lot of the hormones that the intestines make that are very important to um, glycemia, such as GLP-1 and uh, there's many others. Um, they are released in a higher amount, and so they actually have a more powerful effect to improve type 2 diabetes control. Thanks. Um, so in terms of bariatric surgery and its ability to improve diabetes control or put type 2 diabetes into remission, uh, we do know that remission of diabetes or improvement in control is 
inferior for gastric banding compared to the other procedures because of that difference in mechanism that I just talked about. Um, predictors of who might be more likely to go into remission uh, of their type 2 diabetes with bariatric surgery include younger age at the time of bariatric surgery, if they've had a shorter duration of type 2 diabetes, so they've got more uh, endogenous pancreas function left, right? they're earlier in their natural history, a higher preoperative serum C peptide level. So every time we make a molecule of insulin, we also make a molecule of C peptide. So if you have higher C peptide, that means you have more insulin secretory capacity. Therefore, you've got more functioning active pancreas uh, to control sugars after surgery. And finally, the preoperative lack of need for insulin. So that's really all pointing towards being earlier in the natural history of type 2 diabetes. That's when you have the best chance to intervene and put the type 2 diabetes into remission. Now, notice I use the word remission. I don't use cure. I don't use resolution. And that's because we have to remember that the type 2 diabetes can come back. That pancreas is still, has still been tired out for probably many years before having the surgery. Uh, that pancreas is also genetically programmed to have beta cell decline. So it's really important that if a person's type 2 diabetes goes into remission, that we need to be checking glycemia on an annual basis to make sure uh, to watch in case it were to come back, because we wouldn't want that to go undiagnosed. Now, what about complications of diabetes? Of course, the purpose in treating diabetes is not just to control numbers. It's because those numbers improving translates to a decrease in complications of, of uh, diabetes. So we know that uh, the evidence as it stands now um, suggests that bariatric surgery may reduce or prevent development or progression of albuminuria. So that's protein leak into the urine, which is one of the microvascular complications of diabetes. That's pretty clear from the existing, existing literature. There may be an improvement in cardiovascular events and mortality. Um, that's based on um, observational data and uh, the landmark SOS study, of course, as well. Uh, retinopathy seems to be a bit more of a murky story. Um, in uh, people who go into remission from their diabetes, and if they, if they, especially if they have not had retinopathy um, come on prior to the bariatric surgery, it seems to be that there is a decreased risk of retinopathy uh, because um, they don't have retinopathy to begin with, and also by virtue of the ability to put diabetes into remission. But if a person has existing retinopathy prior to bariatric surgery, it seems like it can go in any direction, that probably most people do benefit from a retinopathy perspective, uh, but some stay the same, and there have been cases of retinopathy worsening as well. So uh, in someone who has retinopathy prior to bariatric surgery, it's important to counsel them about that. And we see that also in, in people sometimes who have a big drop in A1C, let's say when they become pregnant, or if they have a high A1C and we start them on insulin and their A1C comes right down, that can actually paradoxically worsen retinopathy on occasion. And this is probably a similar picture that uh, we can see uh, sometimes in people after bariatric surgery. Type 1 diabetes. Uh, so just as we have seen an increase in obesity in our general society, so too have we amongst patients with type 1 diabetes. So what can we do for people who have type 1 diabetes who struggle with their weight? Well, in terms of medications, um, we uh, favor the use of mealtime insulin analogs because they're shorter acting and it gives a person more flexibility. So again, we're adapting their medication to fit their lifestyle rather than having to eat at regimented times because they're on a longer acting mealtime insulin. Um, we also try to use uh, insulins with a lower risk of hypoglycemia. So uh, we are seeing newer generations of insulins coming out, uh, basal insulins, for example, that have a lower risk of low blood sugars, so patient, patients don't need to eat to treat their loads. Um, lifestyle approach is very similar to that of patients with type 2 diabetes. Um, sorry, just to go back to diabetes medications, you're probably wondering about some of the weight loss ones for type 2, like the SGLT2 inhibitors and GLP-1s. Um, they have, um, have been studied and are being studied currently in type 1 diabetes. I've been an investigator on, uh, in both classes. Um, and while we have potentially seen some benefits, uh, this is certainly not something that we recommend in people with type 1 diabetes outside of a clinical research trial. So this is something that's under investigation. Um, pharmacotherapy for obesity, so Orlistat and uh, liraglutide, uh, is not adequately studied in people with type 1 diabetes at this time. 
and bariatric surgery, uh, there's insufficient evidence uh, for that as well. So uh, the existing data suggests that there is an improvement in cardiovascular risk factors uh, in people with type 1 diabetes who have bariatric surgery. Um, there may or may not be an improvement in glycemic control. That uh, shows different results for different studies. So my conclusions are number one, to consider both glycemic control and weight management in optimizing glycemic therapy for people with diabetes. That even a modest weight loss can be of benefit in, in improving glycemia and metabolic health. Lifestyle management is the cornerstone of weight management therapy, uh, though most often is not sufficient in and of itself for sustained success. And that pharmacotherapy and bariatric surgery are very important additional treatment options in the appropriate patient with type 2 diabetes. So I'll conclude there. Uh, a lot of what I've said is on my website. Uh, just a note, it's drsue.ca, not .com. That's a sex therapist in the United States. <laughs> it's not sex with Sue. Um, so a lot of those things, just type in the search box and you'll, or else I'm, I can happy to answer questions afterwards. Thanks very much. If I could have the speakers come up for, uh, to the panel table, we'll see if we have just a moment for questions. starts right away. Uh, I'm sorry, we won't have time for questions today. Um, yeah, the individuals who spoke today are certainly available and all very friendly and will answer any questions that you have uh, individually and personally. Thank you for your attention today and thank you to all our speakers. Uh, I have a message and announcement to make. Uh, please stay in the room for the Pesha Kusha session which starts right away. Okay, thank you.